and uh, go over some of uh, the main uh, result uh, obtained uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, but more importantly, I, I want to span, uh, that's what I'm gonna do today, get, uh, talking about some basics and also uh, some re uh, statement of re uh, uh, main result. Uh, in lecture two and three, I, I want to uh, introducing some uh, techniques that was used uh, in the proof of the theorems. Uh, so uh, again, the, the idea is not to give a survey to the area, but more concentrate on the techniques. And hopefully some of you will able to uh, use uh, these ideas to uh, solve other problems. Oh, okay, all right. So let's see uh, what what is a homogenization. And so let me start with uh, the Laplace operator. I write this as a minus Laplace. You can write this in a divergence form uh, with a matrix A being the identity matrix. And this operator uh, is used to describe uh, homogeneous and isotropic material. So the material homogeneous meaning that uh, it's uh, the material behaves the same uh, at every point and isotropic, it does not depend on the direction here. Uh, going a little bit further, we can talk about a general second order elliptic operator uh, in divergence form. And here I wrote it as a, a minus divergence of a matrix, which now depend on X, X uh, being the position here times the gradient. Uh, so in this, uh, so if I write this out, you can write this as a par partial uh, DXI and IJ and DDDXJ. The, the index I and the J are, are summed here. So the matrix here being a, uh, a non-constant matrix, variable matrix. So uh, it, it can be used to deal with materials which are inhomogeneous, uh, materials whose property uh, varies from uh, point to point in, in space. All right. So, okay, so uh, the, the homogenization theory uh, is more tied to the so-called composite material, which is widely used nowadays uh, in industry and in our daily lives here. Okay, so, so what, is, what is a composite material? Or it, sometimes called it just com called a composite. So, you have two or more uh, materials with uh, uh, different physical or chemical properties. And you mix these two material uh, in a proper fashion to create a new material with uh, the desired uh, property. So typically you have two uh, categories of uh, constitutes of something called a matrix and another called a reinforcer here. And these two material are more uh, mixed in some organized manner in a, uh, at a fine scale here. All right, so if we want to model these types of a material uh, in mathematics, uh, we were introducing a, a small parameter, epsilon here, which represents the microscopic scale. And and we're gonna write this coefficient matrix, which, which used to be uh, just A of X. And now you have A of X over epsilon. Epsilon appeared uh, in the denominator of, of the variable X here. Okay, so, and uh, if I scaling back, uh, use Y, the variable Y for X over epsilon, and we will need to uh, assuming some structural conditions and uh, just to try to describe the composite uh, kind of meaning that it kind of organized matter mixed in a fine scale. 
So in mathematics, uh, particularly in PDE here, we can assume in this uh, in a simple setting, the, 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 this matrix A of Y is periodic with respect to some lattice. Uh, but going beyond that, the, the matrix A can be quasi-periodic, uh, almost periodic, or even a realization some stationary random field. So if you look, go, look at this uh, matrix here, which depend on a parameter epsilon and epsilon appear in the denominator. So which means that if you change the variable by, uh, by epsilon size and the property are vastly different. Uh, and therefore, if you want to do a direct computation, uh, that's the way we, try to solve the PD numerically, uh, the cost can be, uh, can, be co uh, can be large because the domain decomposition have to resolve in the epsilon scale. And epsilon could be, could be quite small. So in the 60s, uh, maybe even 50s, uh, and a homogenization theory was developed. So the idea is to use asymptotic analysis to find a effective, uh, sometimes also called averaged or homogenized uh, characteristics of the composite material. And so this is what we are uh, going to talk about in, uh, in, in this uh, series of lecture here. So, we're, so again, let me going back to the PDE, so we're going to consider a family of elliptic operators in divergence form. So I'm putting things together. So my coefficient matrix now becomes A of X over epsilon. Uh, epsilon is, is small. Uh, and uh, uh, rescaled matrix A of Y, Y is X over epsilon here. We're going to make some assumptions. So we're assuming A is real, bounded, measurable, and also uniform elliptic. You can also study this in other contexts, but my emphasis here will be uh, uniformly elliptic here. And in order to do homogenization, we will also need some structural conditions, uh, uh, which is different from the smoothness conditions. By structural conditions, we mean periodic, quasi-periodic, almost periodic, or a stationary rhythm. So that's the setting uh, we, we have here. So in this core, in this lecture, we're only going to deal with periodic uh, matrix. Uh, but a lot of research has been done in a more general study. Okay. All right. So, uh, so here, let's look at a boundary value problem. Uh, like a Dirichlet problem or Neumann problem. So you have, you have a fixed domain omega uh, represents uh, the space occupied the material. And you have a PDE uh, uh, where the coefficient depend on a parameter. So to indicate the solution also depend on the, uh, on the parameter. So we're gonna know the solution by U sub epsilon. So we have a condition, some boundary condition here and we can, just like using Laplacian to describe some kind of stationary process in homogeneous material, and now this uh, boundary value problem is used to describe uh, properties of composites, okay? So again, I want to emphasize here, epsilon is small, small in the sense that uh, it's relative to the linear size of the domain there. All right. So this is the setting for the theory of homogenization. Here. All right. So, uh, so as it turns out, under proper structural conditions, and, uh, and you take the parameter epsilon to zero, and you want to see what happened to the solution. So it turns out 
the solution u epsilon will convert to some function u0 uh, strongly in L2, actually also weakly in H1. Actually, weak H1 implies strong in, in L2. Moreover, the limiting function u0 is a solution of a elliptic equation with constant coefficients. And so and it, it turns out the u0 satisfy the same kind of uh, boundary conditions. In other words, the Dirichlet boundary condition will lead to Dirich, uh, boundary, uh, Dirichlet condition for the limiting function and the Neumann boundary conditions will lead to uh, the Neumann boundary condition. Of course, the Neumann boundary condition is tied to the coefficient. Uh, so the boundary, uh, so the, when the coefficient changes, you have to change the, the, the normal or core normal derivative there. Okay, so that is the, the idea there. So the, again, the limiting uh, function, uh, u0 is a solution of an elliptic equation, L0 in divergence form uh, with coefficient a hat. And a hat here can be computed uh, explicitly, uh, at least in the periodic setting, uh, using the coefficient a of y. So in other words, it doesn't depend on the domain. It only depends on the coefficient a here. So roughly speaking, this means that uh, uh, for we can uh, describe a composite material uh, by an effective homogeneous material. So that's, that, is the, that is the idea here. All right, so, uh, so the same kind of question can be uh, extended to all sorts of PDs. So here I'm writing out a general PD, second order, linear or nonlinear, and you have a, some kind of epsilon dependence in the equation, so uh, you, and you want to find out uh, what happened to the solution as the parameter epsilon goes to zero. Uh, moreover, you want to uh, uh, find the equation of the limiting function satisfied. In other words, what is the effective or homogenized PD uh, for this equation uh, uh, which originally depend on epsilon. Okay, so what we're doing here is that, so in practice, what, what you're doing here is that instead of solving a PDE uh, with a small parameter uh, and with whose uh, direct computation may be costly, you solve a PDE with constant coefficients or at least with no epsilon inside, or the cost which uh, the cost is much less. Uh, you do not have to resolve the de domain decomposition to the epsilon scale here. So that's the first step. Whenever you have a, a, a general PD, uh, you want to do the qualitative theory. Uh, so that's the first step here. But once you have the first step done uh, in the last 10 or uh, 15 years, there is a growing interest in the so-called quantitative theory. Uh, that is, so we know epsilon, we know as epsilon goes to zero, the solution u epsilon converts to u zero. So here we can ask, what is the convergence rate? So you take the difference of u epsilon and u zero, you measure the difference in some norm, L2 norm, LP norm, some other norm, uh, what's the rate in terms of epsilon? Okay, we can also uh, study the regularity theory or uh, geometric properties of the solution. And here the idea is to establish estimates with constant C independent of epsilon. Okay, so normally you look at all this uh, theorems, regularity theorems uh, in, 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 the, in, in the textbook, there is always a solution. 
I mean, I'm sorry, there is always a hypothesis on the regularity of coefficients. Uh, uh, and uh, unless there's a de George Nash theory and you're assuming the coefficients is bounded measurable. Otherwise, if you're assuming a little bit of regularity, even continuous, and uh, you know the estimate will not hold uh, uh, uniformly with respect to uh, epsilon because this coefficient matrix A of X of, of over epsilon is not uniformly continuous with respect to epsilon. And that of course is the general situation. And now you have some kind of additional structural condition, periodicity, quasi-periodicity, uh, random. Uh, and the hope is that it may have some kind of uniform or large scale regularity uh, for the solution. Yeah. So that's uh, the so-called quantitative theory of homogenization here. Okay, so that's the kind of problem we are looking at here. All right, so here I'm talking about the lecture plan. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, a family of uh, elliptic operators uh, in divergence form. Uh, and uh, we're assuming the matrix A is real bounded a uniform elliptic. And, uh, and also I'm going to look at this in, in, a, in a simple setting, assuming that the matrix is periodic, particularly uh, assuming it's one periodic, periodic with respect to the standard integer lattice. Uh, this is not so much of an assumption you, if, you, it's, if it's periodic with respect to some other lattice, you can always use a linear transformation to change to a standard one here. And we may need some smooth conditions if you will talk about the scales below the scale, uh, scales below epsilon there. Okay, so that is the setup. It's a very, it's a simple setting and we we'll, wanna we'll, uh, get some ideas crossed. Uh, but I wanna mention that uh, 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 research has been done in a much general setting here. All right. So uh, today uh, in the first lecture, I'm giving you an introduction. I'm gonna talk about a, a, a corrector, which is an important uh, concept in, 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 homogeni in homogenization theory. Uh, I'll give you the definition of effective coefficients in this simple setting. And then I will talk about compacting theorem and, and, and looking at some results of a homogenization of a boundary value problems, regularities. I just look at a general flavor of a result, uh, what can be done or what has been done uh, in the area, okay? In the second and third lecture, I, uh, I want to I want to concentrate on the regularity theory. As I mentioned, the quantitative theory also deal with problems related to convergence rate. Uh, so we're, we're not gonna talk about that uh, here. Uh, so uh, there are uh, two kinds of method. So again, I, my emphasis will be on the method uh, rather on the result. Uh, that is the hope is that you were able to maybe apply some of the methods here to other problems. Uh, you know, okay, so the first one I will talk about a compactness method, uh, which is, uh, uh, classical uh, method in, in, in the study of uh, uh, nonlinear PDE and uh, and the calculus of variation. Although the problem we're dealing with uh, here is a linear problem, the operator is linear, but this turns out that this classical method from nonlinear PDE also turns out to be a, a useful, a very useful tool. The second method is uh, due to uh, Scott Armstrong and Charles Smart. That is some more quantitative. So compactness is a argument by contradiction. Uh, here, uh, the convergence rates, it's, it's, a, it's a forward uh, uh, argument here. Uh, so there's some advantage of doing that in particular dealing with boundary regularities because uh, the boundary corrector is, is very hard to construct and, and estimate. 
There's some other problems I was not able to deal with here. There's the Carlton Zygmunt theory uh, using reverse Hilder uh, inequalities, and, and that used to deal with W1P estimate. I have a reference uh, at the end of uh, the presentation. If, if you're interested, you can go. Uh, one, one, uh, one is a uh, kind of a lecture notes uh, on this topic. And another is a book I published uh, a few years ago. Okay. All right, so let me going back to uh, the problem. The first one is it's a, a corrector. Uh, as I mentioned, the corrector is, is very important. Uh, it's also difficult to construct. Uh, not in this setting, but this is this one is easy. But if you deal with nonlinear problems, the corrector is hard. Uh, in this simple setting, the corrector is a periodic function which satisfy this equation. So, uh, the, so, uh, so the corrector here is chi j, and you uh, you have uh, on the right hand side of the equation you have a gradient of y g, which is just a, uh, which is just a unit vector, vector in the gs direction. And uh, so you have a divergence of a y times uh, say e g here. Okay, so the characters here is periodic because I'm assuming the coefficients is periodic. And uh, we also want to normalize the character. So the mean value of the character uh, on a torus uh, is zero here, okay? So uh, in this simple setting, you can uh, prove the existence of uniqueness easily by applying the lax milgram theorem uh, to this bilinear form on H1 of dt, dt is the torus, or just a, a, a cube with periodic, periodic boundary conditions. And this bilinear form is bounded and the coercive because of the ellipticity. Okay, so the existence in this setting is no problem. And one of the key property is that the character, you, you take a linear function xj and, and you multiply by epsilon and then you add this uh, rescaled uh, character xj of x epsilon. This, it, this actually produce a solution to the whole space, okay? So the way I understand is that this corrector is correct the linear function, okay? So for instance, let's take a Laplacian operator. We know constant is a solution. We also know linear function is a solution. But in this case, the linear function is not because the coefficients are, very, uh, are not, coefficient matrix is not a constant matrix there. And so what you hear, you see is that the, if, we are, if I add a little bit to the linear function, I actually end up with a solution. So, so the, the thing I'm adding here have a small uh, uh, amplitude, but it's oscillating in the scale epsilon. So it's highly oscillatory, but it's getting smaller and smaller. So the, uh, so the corrector is a very important tool uh, in this theory here. That, that just the, this is the definition. All right, so with this corrector, we can construct the effective operator or homogenized operator. So the coefficient matrix is denoted by A hat. And it's given by this formula. Uh, so it's given by this formula. So, so what you uh, see here is that you look at the, uh, this, this formula here. The first term is AIG. In other words, one of the terms when we're averaging this operator is obtained by averaging the coefficient. But that's not the whole story. You also have the second term, which is AIK, D chi J, D Y K, K sum here from one to D. So in other words, the effective equation, the coefficient of the effective equation 
is not a simple average of the coefficient you had before, even in the case of a periodic coefficients. And it involved the corrector. So if you start with a diagonal matrix homogenized, you may end up with a not diagonal matrix, okay? And it's not hard to prove that this A hat is elliptic, actually with the same elliptic equation uh, for the lower bound, but the upper bound will, could be different uh, with the mu one here, but only depend on mu and the dimension. Mu here is the ellipticity constant for the original uh, operator, okay? So that this, this, this are the, uh, uh, formulas for the for the homogenized operator and also for the homogenized uh, matrix or homogenized coefficients all right so uh, so what is the what's what's the what's the problem what is the homogenization of the Dirichlet problem let me just talking about this one here this is a classical it's now uh, since uh, maybe 60s 70s okay so I'm assuming A is uh, elliptic and periodic. And I take omega to be a bounded Lipschitz domain. And I uh, take a solution, a weak solution in H1 of omega to this Dirichlet problem, okay? L epsilon of U epsilon equal to F. F is in H minus one, the dual of H1 zero. And the little f on the boundary is in h one half, the trace of h one function, h one of omega here. Okay, so this is a classical uh, Dirichlet problem uh, in, in uh, weak uh, weak solutions. And uh, so the, the L epsilon here. Let me just going back. I don't know if I, uh, if you still remember that formula here, uh, right here. So it's a uh, divergence form. Uh, the coefficient matrix is A of X over epsilon. Okay, so, so we rescaled the, the variable from X to X over epsilon here. But otherwise the coefficient is it's, uh, bounded measurable and, and uh, uniformly elliptic. The, the actual condition here was assuming A is periodic with respect to some lattice, the structural condition here. All right. So what, uh, so what is the, uh, uh, the problem? The problem here is that what happened when you let epsilon goes to zero, okay? So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the conclusion. As epsilon goes to zero, uh, U epsilon has a limit weakly in H1 and therefore strongly in L2. Moreover, we can say a little bit more, uh, this coefficient times the gradient, uh, sometimes it re is referred as a flux. So the flux of the original operator converge to the flux of the homogenized operator. So A hat times gradient of U zero here. So weekly also, um, oh, this is a, uh, this is a typo, I mean, it's not weakly in H1, it's weakly in L2. Only weakly in L2, okay? And U0 here is the solution of the homogenized problem. The homogenized problem is also a Dirichlet problem with the same boundary condition, uh, F, little f here, and but it's for the homogenized operator. So that's the homogenized, Homogenize, homogenization of the Dirichlet uh, problems. Okay. All right, so the, the next theorem is about uh, the Neumann problem. So assumption is the same, periodic and elliptic. Uh, so we do not need any smoothness. Bonded measurable will be good. Uh, omega is Lipschitz domain. 
and you look at a general, I'm writing this maybe a too complicated form here, just taking a, a Neumann problem. So Neumann condition, the du epsilon, d nu epsilon, nu epsilon there is the core normal derivative associated with the operator. Okay. And uh, so uh, f and g are L2 functions and, 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 and the little g is in h negative one half the dual of H one half there on the boundary. So again, what we ask, what happens when epsilon goes to zero here? Uh, so the result, uh, again, sorry, <laughs> that's a typo. Uh, it's in uh, the flux converge weakly in L2. Uh, and the solution U epsilon converge weakly in H one and therefore strongly in L2 there. All right, and uh, the limiting function U0 is the solution of the homogenized problem, which is also a Neumann problem, but the boundary condition du0, d nu0, that's a core normal derivative associated with the homogenized operator. Uh, homogenized operator L L zero there. So uh, so these are qualitative uh, uh, results. So you take a simple setting. Uh, you look at the solution. You ask, uh, what is do you do? We have a limit uh, in some uh, uh, space, and uh, what is the equation uh, that the limit satisfies? So these two theorems tells you that uh, at least for elliptic in the divergence form, and uh, we have a formula for uh, for the homogenized uh, equation uh, using uh, correctors. All right. So uh, so this is this is now a long long time ago. Uh, and uh, so the next question here we we want to ask is uh, can we say something about the quanti quantitative. For instance, we know u epsilon converge to u0 in L2 because you converge weakly in H1. And so we can ask, what is the convergence rate? Uh, what kind of power of epsilon you can have uh, as if, uh, for this L2 norm of the difference? Okay, so that's one type of a problem. The second type of problem is, uniform regularity, sometimes called a large scale regularity. So in other words, we ask for estimate of the solution u epsilon with bounding constant C independent of epsilon. Okay, so, and, uh, and so that's, that's a lot of research has been done on these two uh, questions. All right, so uh, to get some idea, let's look at these uh, correctors uh, and the linear functions here. So again, the question is, suppose you have a PDE with right-hand side F, uh, and in what space the solution belongs to uniformly in epsilon? Okay, classically, of course, it depends on, on the on, uh, on the regularity of F. But let's just say that F is as smooth as you wish. Can we say anything about this one? So we're going back to this corrector and we know that the linear function plus this rescaled corrector is a solution uh, of, the, of the equation in everywhere in space. All right, so let's take the gradient of this solution so we got a gradient of UK. Uh, sorry, that should this should be U epsilon. So we will. So the first term you got a gradient of a linear function that's a constant. So nothing to say. For the second term, you got a gradient of the corrector. Uh, when you take a gradient, there's an epsilon coming up in a denominator, so cancel that epsilon. So you have a gradient of chi k of x over epsilon. 
So you ask which this which space this uh, function which this gradient belongs to uniformly uh, in Ipsu, and so you can see that this function, the gradient of chi k, the best you can hope for is is uniformly bounded. It's not even uniformly continuous, not to mention uniform C1 alpha. Okay, so as far as the regularity, the uniform regularity is concerned, the best we can hope for is that the uniform Lipschitz for the solution UK. Okay. So going, so there's another kind of estimate. We'll talk about that in a second, or maybe in a lecture. There, the, this restriction somehow was restricted, was related to the small scale. If we measure the regularity above the scale epsilon, you can actually get any uh, uh, higher order regularities. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. So, so do you have any assumption on a um, periodic on the right hand side. Uh, no, no, F, uh, capital F here is any function. In general, we do not uh, assume uh, capital F is periodic. Okay. If we do, it's reduced to a, a problem on the torus because heard, both sides will be periodic. And I've heard uh, your AIG is defined on the Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, AIG is periodic. And so you only define need to define on the torus and then the periodic extent of the whole space. Yes, it's defined everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, we do not assume F is periodic. Uh, for otherwise, it reduced to a problem on the torus. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the uh, so let's talk about this classical uh, estimate due to. Uh, Marco Avalinda uh, and, and Fang Hua Lin uh, back in 87. So, uh, oh, oh, everything we say uh, today uh, works for systems. So the way I present it only for the scalar case, but all the theorems uh, hold for elliptic systems, where the coefficient is of a matrix, you have a tensor here, AIG and alpha beta. Okay, so assuming the coefficient matrix is coefficient tensor is elliptic, periodic, uh, I need a little bit uh, of uh, uh, smoothness, a huder continuity uh, would be suffice. Well, assuming omega is C1 alpha, which is also required even for Laplace uh, for the ellipsis estimate up to the boundary. So we look at this Dirichlet problem. Okay, and uh, the estimate is that if P is greater than the dimension, sigma is positive, then the Lipschitz norm of U epsilon, which is the L infinity norm of the gradient of, if, of, of, of the solution, is bounded uniformly by the data. LP norm of capital F in omega plus C1 sigma norm of the boundary data on the boundary. And uh, the key here is that this constant C is independent of epsilon. Okay, so if you allow C to depend on epsilon, that will be a classical. Uh, that, that's already known. Uh, but uh, here with the extra assumption that the coefficient is periodic, we can the estimate is uniform uh, with respect to the parameter epsilon. Okay, so this is a, uh, the Lipschitz estimate for for the for the Dirichlet problem. Okay, uh, it took a while uh, to get to the uh, Lipschitz estimate uh, for the Neumann uh, condition. So the the, uh, the assumption on the coefficient tensor is the same. 
it's elliptic, periodic, and the filter continues. And we also assume omega is C1 alpha. And when I look at the Neumann uh, problem, so the equation is the same, L epsilon u epsilon equal to f in omega. And this d nu epsilon is the co-normal derivative associated with the coefficient matrix. And uh, so the estimate is that the Lipschitz norm of the solution is uniformly bounded. Uh, that F LP norm P greater than the dimension. And because the Neumann problem is on the first order uh, derivative of the solution. So the G here is in C sigma. Sigma is any positive. No, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. That's not uh, even true for uh, harmonic functions. So, so, so C is any possible number? Yes, it yes. Cannot be it cannot be infinity. Right, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so this is more or less related to uh, the singular integral operator is, is not bounded from L infinity to L infinity. Uh, that's right. So you, we need some, a little bit of regularity on, 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 on G there, beyond L infinity. Yeah. So. Oh, <laughs> very good. Uh, so, we, so this was proved actually uh, in 2013 uh, using compactness. And uh, in 2016, it was proved uh, by different approach uh, using convergence rate, but also extended to the case where the coefficient is almost periodic. So, uh, so I mentioned two, two, two papers here. So they're using different method, but the second method also extended to uh, more general uh, coefficients. So from periodic to almost periodic. Almost periodic. So for almost periodic, you mean that A would be dependent on X as well as on, on Y, but Y is periodic? Uh, the almost periodic, well. Uh, that's local periodic. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of periodic. So almost periodic, well, I should mention what is, First, we can talk about a quasi-periodic. So if you have two periodic functions, if they are period, period are not related by a rational number, you're adding these two periodic functions together, it's not periodic. You cannot find a common periodic. But it's in a class of so-called quasi-periodic. And there is, so there's a class Kind of a complete, you can use some norm to complete that, that generates some uh, almost periodic classes. Okay, so it's a class of functions uh, which you do not have a period, but you still have some oscillating behavior that you can quantify. Yeah. Uh, let me ask a question. For that. Yes. <laughs> the fit two is out because you're assuming that. Coefficient is the order, and uh, in the classical theory, you have this uh, uh, this uh, W2P estimate. Uh, it's a divergence form, so we only ask for W1P. Oh, okay. okay, so the, what I'm saying is that uh, if you do the greedier C, uh, greedier UX, the C alpha estimate, or you want the second order derivative. I'm most likely to be blow up in the in the epsilon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know how? Epsilon. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, because you can relate locally. You can just do a local estimate. Okay, so you know precise how that C yeah. depend on epsilon. Yes, okay. that's right. Yes, right. That's good. <laughs> so, sorry, I believe. No problem. For another meeting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Right. So this, as I mentioned by example earlier. 
the Lipschitz estimate is the best we can hope for. That you look at this, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, example, you see the gradient of U epsilon there. The first term is bounded, it's also constant, but the second term is oscillating. There's no regularity, there's no uniform regularity for the second term. Uh, not even uniformly continuous. So there's no uniform C1 alpha estimate. It's just uniform uh, in L infinity. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, another uh, result I, I want to mention here is the W1P estimate. So uh, the assumption is uh, that A is elliptic, periodic. Uh, this time you can lower the regularity to uh, VMO, just like a uh, variable coefficient case. Okay, so we look at the equation L epsilon, U epsilon equal to divergence of F. Let's say U epsilon equal to zero on the boundary. Then we have LP to LP for the, from, the, from F to the gradient of U epsilon. Again, the key is that uh, this constant C is independent of, of epsilon. Okay, so uh, there, I mentioned several names here. Uh, so go, for smooth domain, for smooth domains, this goes to uh, for the scalar equation. This goes to Avalinda uh, and Fang Hua Lin, and the Cafferati and Perry also did the interior estimate, uh, and I have some work on this uh, uh, quite a while ago. For yes, there's also a Neumann bound. Okay, uh, another type of estimate, this is more related to uh, uh, interest in harmonic analysis, that you assuming the boundary is some L2 function, okay, uh, or LP function, and you want to estimate uh, the non-tangential maximum function. So, Again, here we try to uh, show that the non tangential maximum function, say for instance, is uniformly bounded. Uh, so the U epsilon star indicate, denotes the non tangential maximum function for U epsilon there. Okay, again, the key is that this constant C is independent of epsilon. All right, so. Uh, there's also a lot of work done in the last uh, 10 uh, years, uh, stochastic homogenization. Uh, several uh, people are involved, at least the name here, but I have not done any work in this area, so I, I don't want to mention uh, this. So again, uh, we're going to concentrate on the periodic case. All right, so I mentioned this before, that, uh, there are uh, there, if you're interested, there are two references here. Uh, and the first is the lecture notes I wrote for the Parks IAS, uh, Park City Mass Institute. A, there's a, a summer school. And uh, so there's, a, a, which, which give you an introduction to quantitative homogenization of elliptic equations with, with periodic coefficients. And I also have a book uh, published about uh, four or five years ago there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, any questions? So I mean like the, the equation, so the right hand side is a, uh, Fixed function. Right? Yes, yes. So, is there any result about like 